Secret Church helps us focus and remember to focus on um, the persecuted church because much of the persecuted church around the world can only meet uh, sh at short periods of time, and when they do, they have a real, real time of training. And so that's what we see this as. Um, this is a time for us to really study the Word of God. I want to remind you of a couple of things that we said su Sunday morning. Um, and one of those things is that, you know, the Chinese are under great persecution. Um, this is, if you've never heard of him before, um, he is now a, going to obviously be a lifetime chairman um, that is going to be there and be ruling over China. And he has tremendously powerful um, data gathering tools that they have developed. And um, already right now, over 1.5 million workers are in concentration camps because they pose a threat or, or a perceived threat to the state of China. Um, and so there's a, a great concern um, over the freedoms of China and the people in China, and especially the over 100 million Christians that are there. Just kind of look at these pictures a little bit. You see the police officer there standing in the doorway of this home. Um, back up a couple of them. I, I want to see just a few of these. Back up again. Um, here they're having a, a worship time, and uh, the police are there. They have made their way in. Um, back up a little bit more. And here they're coming in, taking names, and um, collecting cell phones. I shared with you Sunday that one of our um, people from Sheridan Hills that has planted a church in China, um, they are there, and three weeks ago the police came in. They arrested 15 of the people, and they took everyone's cell phone and hooked them up to machines um, that the police brought in with them and dumped all of the data um, off of their cell phones. So their contact list, their SMSs, and all that's there. And that's just part of the way uh, China seeks to control. Um, we, we see a lot of pressure um, that's upon the church of China. Um, and it's not only the Church of China. The Ch Church of India, perhaps, is the most persecuted um, church um, that's in the world today on a grand scale. Um, the new Indian prime minister that is in charge is an ex what we would call a fundamentalist extreme Hindu. And um, as a result of that, um, he is seeking to get rid of all Muslims um, and their influence, not get rid of them, but to reduce all of their influence as well as seeking to reduce all of the influence of the Christian movement in India. And so we're, we're concerned about those things. I'm very, very proud that there are hundreds of millions, of, or excuse me, um, tens of millions of Chinese who are saying, come and get us, um, bring a bigger truck, because you're going to need a bigger one to take all of us. Um, they are standing firm in their faith. And this was posted live as a young group of leaders in China that simply said, um, we are young leaders in China, here are our faces, and we are going to stay with the, fra with the faith of the gospel of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, a, that's just incredibly powerful. Um, chair, or Pastor uh, is, um, is just a representative of many pastors that are currently um, under pressure. May we not take for granted the freedoms that we have in this moment that we have. This moment, not just tonight to learn, but this moment to live our faith in the open and to live our faith boldly. There are other people who are living their faith um, for Christ amidst all of the threat of whatever this world can throw at us. And tonight, I just want us to pray for them as we begin our study tonight. I want us to, I believe that we will study better and we will seek to inculcate these things into our life and live it out um, more faithfully to the people all across South Florida, in our neighborhoods, in our homes, everybody around us, that we would just seek to be faithful to the God of love and grace. Let's pray together um, for the persecuted church around the world tonight. Let's pray. Holy Father, tonight we remember that this is a fallen world, as we will see again in our Bible study tonight. That our sin has caused there to be great enmity 
between nations and between ideas and ideals. And Lord, that our great struggle is not only on the outside, but it's even on the inside, very often of who we are. The things of this world that want to destroy our lives. But Lord, I thank you that you indeed are a gracious God with a good plan. And that that plan has been shown throughout the ages. That you're a God who says, come and live. Lord, I thank you that there are brothers and sisters all across India and North Africa, in the Middle East, and all the way across over Asia to the far reaches of China who have come to believe in you. Lord, I thank you that even amidst all of the threat and the hardship and the pressure, and Lord, the loss of husbands and wives being separated and fathers being taken from their children and mothers being being separated from their families. Father, I, I thank you that you're in the midst sustaining people even in those circumstances and that you... Your word, your truth is going forth even in the darkness. Lord, today we pray for um, Pastor and the many others like him that are sitting in a prison cell somewhere tonight. Lord, we pray that their faith would be strong and we pray that their witness would be great. We pray that guards around them and judges and advocates and lawyers around them that hear them Lord, would hear the gospel and believe. And Lord, we pray that in the most unlikely places, the smallest villages or the grandest cities, Lord, that the gospel would flourish because your people are faithful to you. Lord, because it's your good pleasure to use their witness. And so, Lord, we pray not only for them, but we pray for ourselves tonight, that we would be a people who do not take our freedom for granted But Lord, that we would not only be grateful for it, but that we would use it so that people right here in Hollywood and around South Florida that know us as a church, that know us as individuals, would be able to hear the gospel. Lord, I pray for James, my friend, that I am that I'm concerned about, that I am hoping that he will come to hear the gospel. Lord, I I pray that you would give all of the grace and all of the wisdom that he needs in order to be able to come to see who you are. And Lord, I pray that your great love would flood in his heart and that he too would come to see who you are in full and free in the greatest measure. Lord, thank you for our study tonight. Pray that you would lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, Sunday morning we looked at a very interesting thing. We looked at something that's kind of a hot topic Um, The issue of heaven, we started to talk about that a little bit. We talked about some books that have been on the bestseller lists, Um, kind of shocking. Um, I know that some of you probably have seen this book. I've never seen this book. I've never read this book. Has anybody seen this book in a store or in an airport or somewhere around? Some of you are going, yeah, it's on my nightstand. Okay, that's all right. Um, Or The Boy Who Came Back. I was was also amazed that there's been movies made about all of these, and maybe some of you have even seen those movies, but, um, and not just those books, but many other books. We saw just one right after another, that there have been many that have been very powerful books about this idea of heaven and hell. But what did we say, what, and what was the point, some of you may want to remember this, and, or some of you may be able to help us remember, what did, the ne- go to the next slide there, what did John MacArthur say is the problem with a lot of these books in this day and time? What, what, what's the problem? Okay, say that again, Chad. Nobody comes back from heaven. Okay. You when, stay. when we look at the word of God, if you go to heaven, you stay there. And I, I'm afraid if you go to hell, you stay there too. But, I mean, the picture is, is that we don't see in Scripture the testimony of people going to heaven and coming back. We see in Proverbs 30, verse 4, who has ascended, uh, ascended to heaven and come down. The answer to that is no one has ascended into heaven except for he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So there's only one that has left the halls of heaven and come back, and that being the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh, the Messiah who would pay for our sins. So the biblical accounts that we see in the Bible are really this. They are visions, not journeys. I thought that that's a very important thing for us to recognize. Um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, and John, the only ones that had prophetic visions, not journeys, and not near-death experiences. 
And no one even really described heaven. You say, well, wait a minute. What about Isaiah? Isaiah definitely describes the manifest presence of God, the very presence of God in Isaiah chapter 6. But really the picture is, beyond that, there, and John certainly does in the Revelation, but beyond that, there is not experience, the description of their experiences. Keep on going there. Wayne Grudem also had a powerful quote. Notice this, remember what he says, all the biblical writers who saw heaven and described their visions gave comparatively sparse details, but they perfectly agree. Their visions are not fixed on, excuse me, all of their visions are all fixed on God's glory and defines heaven and illuminates everything there. They are overwhelmed, chagrined, petrified, and put to silence by the sheer majesty of God's holiness. What he's saying is, is that if you look at the majesty of God's holiness in the visions, that is the focus, not our temporal, fun, little ideals about heaven. So, very important point that is made there as we blast on. We need to lay aside our traditions and run to God's word. You know, traditions die hard, habits die hard, um, ideas that we grew up with about heaven and hell and about a lot of things die hard, but we need to let God's word show us what is true and what is not true. Um, John Piper was one of the other ones who really helps us with that, and he is saying, may our mission in the world not be just the maintenance of our churches, but may our mission in the world be that which lives out the gospel. So that's really part of the picture of all of this semester of what we're going to be doing, what we're talking about. We need to pray about this. We need to pray because our lives are at stake for eternity and others' lives are, are at stake for eternity. So that's where we want to come to page number eight tonight and uh, just kind of notice this. Um, you can just rest assured, you know, the, you, and if you don't have notes, Daniel and some of the other guys have notes, just lift your hand if you need some. Uh, Jose has some. Uh, just lift your hand. But let's, let's blast in for the next few minutes, just a few minutes, we're going to look tonight at the fragility of life in the finality of death. What do we mean by the fragility? What does that mean? What's another word for the fragility of life? Okay, yeah, we see the word fragile. What do we mean by that? Ooh, it's delicate. I mean, it's, it's you know, life is fragile. You know, if we sucked all of, the, all of the air out of this room, we would not live very long. We, 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 this, this would be a very short sermon if we sucked all, sucked all the air out of this room. I mean, you see that when you're on an airliner, right? When you get on the airliner, every single flight, what do they do? Ladies and gentlemen, would you please direct your attention to the cabin path? Da, 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 da. Notice where the exits are. And please notice that in the event of a depressurization of this aircraft, an oxygen mask would come down. Immediately place it on your own mask. For those of you with children, what does it say? For those of you with children, what? Put it on your face first. Do you know why? Because at 33,000 feet, if there is a rapid de depressurization, the fact of the matter is the air is being sucked out of the plane. But if the air is being sucked out of the plane, it's also being sucked out of your lungs. And you have about eight seconds before you black out if you don't have oxygen under those circles. I used to think, what are you talking about? I can hold my breath for 30, you know, I can hold my breath for 45 seconds or a minute. Well, you guys don't know, you know, and then I had an airline pilot one time explain to me, son, that's not the way it works at 33,000 feet. Life is fragile. What about fluids? You don't have water. Did you know, just in just a matter of a few days, if you do, if you do not have water, just to, I mean, you can, you can go about 30 or 40 days without food, literally, maybe even longer. But water is very different than that. Water, you, you have to have it. Water without a day, and you, I don't know if you, any of you have gone without a day, a whole day without drinking anything. But that's very uncomfortable. Becomes very uncomfortable. Um, Lily's sweet dad went home to be with the Lord this, this week. And uh, even um, the funeral was this morning, and they're here tonight. And friends, I, I'm impressed with that, that here they've buried her dad. And, and this morning we were at the funeral in Hialeah, and here they are studying the Bible tonight together. I want to encourage you to have that kind of resolve. But um, he went a few days without water. 
he went a few days without hydration. And as a result of that, um, he eventually slipped um, away. Life is fragile. Um, this, this evening, I want us to see that. I want us to see what the Bible says about the fragility of life and the finality of death. Look what it says in Psalm 90 in verse 12, right there at the top of your outline. And just kind of circle that whole verse because I don't want you to miss that. Notice what it says. So teach us to do what? To number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. You see, wisdom is going to look with reality at the truths of life. It's interesting that in our world today, you can run your life denying realities. I mean, when some of these guys on these massive motorcycles uh, that run up and down Sheridan Street, um, they, are, they are denying the realities of life. In fact, it was just a, last year, a, a guy, the two motorcycles were racing right here in front of the church, and right in front of somebody, um, a whole group of um, parents and, that had just been let out from school, um, they ran it. One of the guys ran into a car right here in front of our church and was killed instantly um, in front of the church. This is a dangerous piece of road right here, but we see people that live life on the edge and they deny the realities of what can happen and they lose their lives because of this denial of the fragility. Thank you, of life. Notice this with me. I want us to see eight foundation um, ideas of this entire study as we study heaven, hell, and the end of the world. Number one, fill it in, life is precious. Life is precious. It is something that is rare. It is something that is very, not just valuable, as we'll see in just a minute, but this is something that has a tremendous value that is to be cherished. In Genesis chapter 1, what happens in Genesis chapter 1? Somebody tells me, tell me, what, what happened in Genesis 1? The creation of the world. Notice here with me. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice the us and the our there. This is the Trinity in the very first chapter of the Bible. It's beautiful. It shows up right away. Father, Son, and Spirit referenced right here through the plural pronouns here. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them rule over dominion, over the let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them and God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that moves upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything, underline it, everything that has breath, I have given them green plant and food. And it was so. And God saw, notice the last part, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, underline this part, and behold, it was what? Very good. Very good. So he says, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then when it's finished, he says, it's very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. Now, this is the, the beautiful picture that, man, life comes from God. It's so interesting how not only will they talk about where does the, where does the cosmos come from, where does all of the universe come from, uh, lots of debate. I've watched a, a fascinating speech by a guy named Dr. Stephen Meyer uh, on YouTube. If you go to and you just put in Stephen Meyer, you can see it. It's uh, real popular right now. It was just from January, and it's gotten a lot of traction in recent days. But just powerfully stated from one of the eminent scientists of the world that is talking about the reality of you have to get you have to deal with this question of where did things start. Um, the, the issue of the origins, and not only the origins, but also the issue of life. 
Um, and so as we do that, we see the beautiful picture of that in, James, or in Genesis 1. Look at Genesis 2, verse 7 through 9. He talks about man being breathed life into him. And look at the end of that. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and then the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So here is the setup, this beautiful, beautiful picture of what God has made. And then look at Job chapter 10, verse 11 through 12. You clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and snooze. That's that's the things that link muscles to bones. So that's, that's holding it all together. You have granted me life and steadfast love, and your care has preserved my spirit. This is the fact that life is precious, and it comes from God. Look at Psalm 22, verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast, and on you I have cast from my birth and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Um, The last part of that, bottom of page 8, you've knit me together in my inward parts. All of that's a beautiful Psalm 139. Just flip the page there. Um, Look at the top of the page. It says, your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written. Every one of them, the days that were formed for me, and yet there was none of them. He said, before even I was born, you knew all about my life. Life is precious. Not only is life precious, but it's incredibly valuable. It's incredibly valuable. Fill that in. Psalm chapter 8 in verse 3. Look what it says. When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? And this is the amazing thing. This is how much God cares about you and about me. Look what it says. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the seas." Have you ever just, and you may want to put out there to the side, part of the side comment here is the vast difference between humans and all other creatures. It's a good thing for us to recognize. The vast difference between humans and all other creatures. It does not say that all of the other creatures were made in God's image. Only humans were made in God's image. We have been made in the likeness of God relationally with a spirit and a soul. We love our dogs. We love our cats. We love, I had Chipper the parakeet. I mean, we, you know, my granddad had Petey. And when Petey died, my granddad from the barbershop called my grandmother and said, Petey died, Petey died. My granddad was real sad that Petey died and it was parakeet. We, we love our animals, as well we should. They're great companions for us. But we are different than they are. And Christ came ultimately to restore the creation, but he came specifically to save men and women, boys and girls, from our sin. And it's a beautiful picture. And how valuable are they, except that the Bible says that God made us a little lower Um, than even angelic beings. Look at the next part. Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the womb of my mother. He named my name. This is how much God cares about us and knows us. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Talking about Jeremiah. That God has a plan. God looks at our lives. He knows who we are. Well, not only that, life is precious and life, life is valuable, but life is also fleeting. Life is slipping away. I remember as a kid growing up in the, in the 70s, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping. How's it go? Into the future. You know, that, that old idea. You remember that? You guys remember that song? Who did that? Who sang that? Steve Miller, thank you. Robert, of course, Robert would know that. Um, But, you know, I mean, we we just, time is slipping away. It is is going away. And we think that it slips back, but, you know, it slips forward. This whole idea that, man, before you realize it, it's happening, it's gone. And, you know, 
people used to always say this when I was a young parent, but now as a parent of two children who have left my home, I just, I see people in the mall with their kids or at Disney World or wherever, and I go, don't blink, don't blink. <laughs> Enjoy it, right? Don't blink. It's, before you know it, they're going to be gone. How many of you can testify that? That's what, that's what happens. You know that that's how fast it happens. And, you know, our children sometimes really reveal that to us. I tell them, I tell them, take pictures, make journal entries. When they say crazy stuff, write it down. It's great. You'll forget it. You know, I wish we had been making more notes about the sweet things they said, the funny things they said, and the funny things they did. And why is that? Because time is slipping away. Look what it, Psalm 39 and verse 4 says. O Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. It's not saying that you don't value me, but what he's saying is in comparison to you, O oh God, and your eternality, my little earthly life is so short. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Now, just today, I was with um, Mike and Lily Todd standing at Vista Memorial Gardens in Hialeah. And this is kind of amazing. I should have, I should have put this on the screen ready for you. But today we buried um, her dad, who was 90 years old, passed away this week. While we, as we buried him, there's 7,100 um, plots in that, or people that are buried in that cemetery. It's not full, so I think it'll be full when there's about 9,000 there, but there's 7,000 people buried there. And while we were standing there, I started to realize my grandmother and grandfather are buried less than 100 feet away. And I walked over there and I found my own grandparents' tombstones. And so today I took pictures of them just right there in the same place. And I looked out across those, those rolling hill that's there a little bit and underneath all of those trees and I saw thousands upon thousands upon thousands of gravestones. And I was just thinking about, man, our time here on earth is so short. And that's just one cemetery. How many of you have ever been to Arlington National Cemetery? You've been to the, where all the crosses are. Many of you have. I would encourage you to go. You say, why would you encourage me to go to a cemetery? It's, it's very, very moving to go and to see the lives of many men and women who have given their lives for our country, served in our country. Um, I've stood at the, uh, the national cemeteries that are in, outside of Paris and in Italy and in Tunisia. Um, we have 32 of them around the world of American service um, uh, personnel who have been buried on foreign land. And it's always as a statement of that they gave their life in a foreign land um, for the sake of their country. But as we stand in cemeteries and as we see that, we can be reminded of how short our lives are. It's a good thing to go visit a cemetery every now and then. In fact, for those of you who have children upstairs or over with the youth, I don't know when the last time you took your kids to a cemetery, but you ought to do that. Um, you ought to take them and you ought to walk with them with their hands and you ought to go and you ought to look at the names and the dates and you ought to notice the family members that are here. This is not a morbid thing to do. It's a good thing for children to understand the brevity of life. You know, in America, we're so wealthy that there's probably very few of you that have ever prepared the body of a loved one for the grave. Just a couple of generations ago, everybody helped prepare their loved ones for the grave. My grandmother said that I remember making a pillow for my grandmother. So my, my grandmother, so it would have been my great, great grandmother that she was preparing a pillow for. And she said that her mother told her she had died while my grandmother was a child. She said, okay, we're going to get a lot of feathers and we're going to make this beautiful and we're going to make it. We, we're going to make, you know, and honoring her grandmother. You know, used to your, your loved one was, was at the home 
and the, the display of their body was typically at your home, and there would, there would be a, an opportunity for the family members and the friends to come and to remember their life together. We don't do any of that anymore. We pay somebody else to take care of that. Increasingly, there's not even a funeral. There's many families that don't even have a funeral of, of any type, in, in any remembrance. But what we need to recognize is that no matter how wealthy you become or how disconnected you become to death, that does not make death go away. The reality is our days are an evening shadow. Look at Psalm 102, verse 11. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. Psalm 103, verse 15 through 16 says, As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For when the wind passes over, it's gone. And its place knows it no more. Notice James 4 verse 13. Come now you who say tomorrow we will go into such a such a town and spend a year there and make a trade or make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? Underline it. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. The next time you're making hot water for tea, just kind of sit there and watch the kettle a little bit. Stand there and look at it. And watch the vapor come up out of that. And just kind of remember this passage and say, that's me. I'm here for a little while. Our earthly lives are so very short. Life is fleeting away. Look at page 10. Death is coming. Death is coming. Second Samuel 14, 14 says, we must all die and we are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Think about that. The water is spilled out on the ground. It immediately goes down into the ground and you can't gather it back up. Psalm 90, verse 10, the years of your life are 70, and even by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are all soon gone, and we fly away. We used to sing that song, I'll fly away, old glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Ecclesiastes is one of the most contemplative books of the Bible that causes us to truly look and to think about our life and about what it's like and its brevity and the righteous versus the wicked. And notice here in 9 verses 2 it says, It is the same for all since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner, and he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also the hearts of the children of man are full of evil. You say, that's my kid. Um, yeah, so the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts when they live. And after they go... To the dead. Now, this is important for us to recognize. You talk about the description of the depravity of sin, and the idea is, is that we're all born in sin, and we all have evil in our hearts, and there's really not much of a limit to what we're capable of. Look in the middle part here. But he who is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. So the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Death is coming. Jonathan Edwards said these words, notice here, resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. Now, who was Jonathan Edwards? Jonathan Edwards lived in the 1700s in um, early America, before we were actually a nation, he was a pastor. And he wasn't being morbid in this. He wasn't being negative in this. He was simply seeking to be sober 
in this. He was simply think, thinking and seeking to be realistic. That you cannot live as if you're never going to die. The fact that you will die should inform the way you live and should influence the way that we live. So what he's saying is, is that I should think of this and consider my life as I live it. Notice this as well. D.A. Carson says, Whatever the church does, it should prepare its members to face death and meet God. You see, if all that we do as a church is share with you nice platitudes about life that might seek to make your life a little bit happier, then we are missing the grand glory of all that God has said for us, that he created us for. You've not been created to live a little happy life now. You've been created to live in tune with God, right with God, not just for a fallen short period of 70 or 80 or 90 years, but for all of eternity. And if a church only seeks to deal with this life now, we are selling you short. We should be seeking to help one another live in light of eternity and all that God has. And that's why um, I think Joel Osteen is so wrong when he is seeking to point people to your best life now. That is so short-lived. This, your best life is not for now. Our best life is for the life that is to come, and we should live in light of that. Well, death is coming. Sometimes letter A, and this is a subset underneath death is coming, right there on your page, in the middle of page 10, death sometimes, it, it is often sudden. So um, we need to recognize that, that death often is sudden. In fact, Jesus, while he was teaching, he refers to this. Um, and he's saying sudden could happen to some of you. That's what he's saying as he's dealing and as he's teaching. Look what it says in Luke chapter 13. There were some present at the time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, and he answered them and said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they'd suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus' message was always consistent. Repent and turn to God for your hope. Repent and turn to God, no matter who you are, no matter how good you think you are. You need to repent and turn to God. Look at the next part. Or those 18 on, on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. So a, a tower nearby at Siloam had fallen over and killed 18 people. You, you know, they didn't have massive tragedies all the time like we do. Um, because of the things that they built. They only went so high. We, we go faster and higher and deeper and all of that stuff. And so when we spin out, it's really more spectacular. Back then, when you just had a little bit of engineering, you didn't create circumstances that killed lots of people at once. But here was 18 people who, di who died when a tower fell over on them. And that would have been on everyone's mind. And he says, or those 18 whom the tower fell over and killed, do you think that they were worse offenders than those who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you that unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So we just need to recognize that death sometimes is sudden. How about this? Death is often surprising. And what do we mean by that? Well, you just don't know when you will die. Um, the very first, Marcy and I graduated from seminary, I was 25 years old. Um, I had never done a wedding, I had never done a funeral, I had never pastored a church, and I went and I planted, I went to a brand new church plant, had just gotten started, and I showed up, and my first week on the job, my first week on the job, um, a young man, a University of Florida student who was 23 years old, engineering student, um, his, mother, his mother was involved in our church plant, Melvin McCall, and her son Kevin had an aortic rupture and he died in a helicopter on the way to the hospital from Jacksonville, uh, from St. Augustine to Jacksonville. And here I am, my very first funeral is a 23-year-old 
who passed away, deeply loved in the community. The, the funeral home had people flowing out into the lawn, everywhere on every side. And I just remember saying, Lord, why did it have to be this one for my first one? I mean, I, uh, it was a tremendous amount of pressure. And, you know, I remember Melvin saying, it was so, so sudden. It was so sudden. We had no idea. And then the surprise of this. You know, even when someone has passed away that you have been caring for for a very, very long time. As a pastor, we, we often hear you say, you know, I cared for my dad for a long time or I cared for my mom for a long time. And when she finally passed away, I still wasn't completely ready for that. It was still a surprise to my heart. And so that's often one of the realities of death. And um, notice this, it's not only sudden and surprising very often, but it's also inevitably sure. There is, there is no question that unless Christ comes back um, before your life is over um, and you are saved in him, your life is going to end um, at one point or another. The current death rate is 100%. Um, that is the death rate. And that's just the way it is. I mean, there's, there's no one who gets around that statistic. Um, notice this, over 150,000 people die every day in the world. It's not a matter of if, it's simply a matter of when. Um, before you flip it over, that's 100 people a minute, by the way. 100 people a minute leave the earth at this point. So death is coming and death is sudden. Look what John Piper says at the top of page 11 up there where it says 100 people are dying every minute. If you could hear them all, you'd hear so many screams you'd go insane. Only God can hear them all and not go insane. God parcels out our awareness in small amounts lest we go under. How can you live in a world like that as a loving person and rejoice in the Lord? Well, we're going to discover how you can do that in the, in the next couple of months. As we study this issue of heaven and hell, life and death in the end of the world, we're going to see how you can rejoice even in the face of death. Number five, death, mark it down. Absolutely, all caps, death is tragic. It is a tragedy. It is a true tragedy. Here's the point. It's not supposed to be this way. It's not to be celebrated. Death is sad. When you look at the big picture, I mean, I realize, well, wait a minute, my dad was really suffering, or my mother was really suffering, or my child was really suffering. We actually... We were relieved and we were happy when the suffering was finally over. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about, the fact that there is death at all, is tragic. And if you remember with me, we talked about Genesis chapter 1 is creation. And Genesis chapter 2 is creation. And then what happens in Genesis chapter 3? In Genesis chapter 3, we see that there is a great violation there's disobedience to God. And when we fall into sin, death comes in. Look what the, the warning was in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Underline it. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, we're going to see this in just a minute. What kind of a die did he mean? I mean, the day that they ate it, you say the storyline does not go that Adam and Eve dropped dead on the garden floor at that moment. No, but when they disobeyed God, death enters in as the great consequence of the fall. 
Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 22. And I'm going to ask somebody to read that. Um, who would read that for me? Je- Derek, do you mind reading Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 through to 24? Cherub. Cherub and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Yeah, so here, here's the grand fall, the great fall in death coming in, that the garden and the tree of life is now apart from them as the consequence. It is a tragic, tragic thing. In the, the vortex of sin that was, that was entered into when we fell into our sin cannot be overestimated or described um, fully. Look at the next part. Not only is death tragic, but death is a consequence of sin. Uh, Genesis 6.13 says, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with the violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so this is the, this is the consequence of this. We see this early on and before the flood. Look at Psalm 90 verse 5. You sweep them away as with the flood. They are like a dream. The grass that is renewed in the morning, it, in the morning it flourishes and it's renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. Your wrath, by your wrath, we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you and our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all uh, our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. And then, of course, we recognize for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Not only is death tragic and death a consequence of sin, but number seven, death is a tool of Satan. It is something that Satan uses. And I will say that even Satan is privileged to use. And what I mean by that is that God in this, in his grand scheme and in his grand plan, Satan is one who uses death and God allows this. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy, underline this, the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So this is the picture of he has the power of death. And he uses that. We're going to end tonight by looking at this multifaceted aspect of death. There are, death has, it's multifaceted. It's not, it's not just you know, one kind of death, a simple type recognition of death. We need to see the biblical scope of death. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, look what it says. Jesus is speaking and he says, do not fear those who kill the body who cannot but cannot kill the soul. So there's two different kinds of death here. What are the two different kinds of death here? Bodily death versus what? Soul death. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We get another picture of it in Ecclesiastes 12, 2, 12 7. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So the, the dust, that's the, that is your, birth, your earthly body, this is the carbon, your carbon footprint. Um, this is your carbon self. This is your body that is going to go away. Look at the next part. For as the bo- James 2, 12, 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So it is multifaceted. And the first one that we recognize is letter A, which you've already said, spiritual death. There is a very real spiritual death. 
It's the separation of a person from who? From God. This is spiritual death. Being separated in your spirit, made in his image, and not being likened unto his image in his spirit with your spirit. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil, now lest he should reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had taken. And he drove the man and, the, the man, and at the east of the, of the garden of Eden he placed the cherub and a flaming sword before him. So the, the same picture is there. This is the separation this is this is saying no you have sinned and you must leave the presence of god god in his perfectness does not accept sin in his presence look at ezekiel 18 verse 4 behold all souls are mine the soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine the soul who sins shall die in Ezekiel 18, but if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all of my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. So that is the grand spiritual death that either we will have or that we won't have. So we recognize spiritual death. Letter B, we recognize physical death. And this is simply the cessation of life in our physical body. The fact of the matter is, as we said, death is a 100% death rate. I mean, a uh, 100% rate um, of death. There's no one that, that goes on without this. As we close tonight, I want you to see page 13. There is a letter C, and this is the most concerning one of all. As we look at this, this is eternal death. Eternal death is the finalization of separation from God. And the Bible is very clear about this. This isn't an obscure idea in the Bible. Um, we see that this is the ultimate result of our sin without a Savior. This is why we need a Savior so badly. And this is why God is so gracious, is that he can rescue us from our sin. Look what it says there in Revelation 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, wow, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Okay, now, can I just put out there to the side of those top two lines? Andrew Coleman, that's me. You know, sometimes when we read these lists, we think, oh yeah, those are the really bad people. Can you just put out there Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7? Do you remember what Jesus' point, his opening sermon was all about? His opening sermon was, if you've hated your brother, you've murdered him. If you've lusted at her, you've slept with her. You're an adulterer. Jesus' opening statements were helping us see that you think that you're good. You think that you've got the law together. But God is showing us that the real issue is the issue of the heart. And he's saying, but look what it says. The sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, underline it, which is what? The second death. So what's the first death? Your physical death. Everyone is going to die physically. But not everyone has to die the second death the final eternal death. And this is the great escape. It's not the Steve McQueen movie of him getting out of a Nazi prison. The great escape is Jesus coming and rescuing us from the decree of our sin against us. Look at Revelation 20 and verse 8. And we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're not 
When I finish reading this, we're not done. There are two more passages I want you to see that I'm going to have on the screen. So I'm just warning you, don't, don't shut off yet. Revelation 20 in verse 6. Look what it says. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Underline the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And this is talking about the people who have been saved. And here is the picture. Notice this. Notice that next part in there, in the middle of that verse, it says, over such the second death has no power. You see, the second death, and what was the second death? It's the spiritual death of being cut off from God. And what it's simply saying this is, hey, blessed is the one who has partaken with the first resurrection. You see, we're talking about two different things here. Resurrection versus death. This is why it's such a big deal that Jesus rose from the dead. And so Jesus being the one he, who is the firstborn from the dead. In fact, there's, there's two places in Scripture that talk about the first resurrection. And it's talking about the primary resurrection, the, the resurrection that gives hope to all other resurrection. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, he, also, he is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and look what it says, the firstborn from the dead. Do you see that on the screen? He's the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself might come to have first place in everything. I want you to understand that Jesus is the primary priority of, of anyone who would ever come back from the dead because he is the Son of God the sinless Son of God, paying for our sin, and He comes back from the dead, that means we can come back from the dead. That means that we can live forever. That means though we die, this is why Jesus would say, anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And the picture is not being in the eternal death, not being cut off from God. For eternity. Look at Romans 8 29. I want to close with this. This is just beautiful. It says very similarly to, to Colossians 1 18. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be, to become conformed to the image of his son. Look what the next part says, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus would be the firstborn from among many brethren. And the idea is, is that all of those who come after him, all of those who come with him into this life, we come into the life that escapes the second death. Now, friends, this is part of understanding the whole gospel. Um, when a church ignores the realities um, of the frailty of life and uh, not only the frailty of life but also uh, the, the permanence of death, we are ignoring the true gospel of Christ. We need to not live our lives as if there's not a sinking ship that we're on. We are on a sinking ship that is headed for the bottom, but there is a lifeboat, a true lifeboat that will get us safely home. And that true lifeboat is the only lifeboat that is going to make it home. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So um, we need to just recognize as we are jumping into a study of heaven and hell and the end of the world, the realities of what the Bible says about the fact that you can live, you can truly live in the joy of what God has designed or by our condemnation of our sin without Christ, you can be separated from God for all of eternity. Now, this, is what, this, this reality is part of what makes the rest of the gospel message make sense. Um, if we do not recognize the brevity of this life and the frailty of this life and the fragility of it, then we will not recognize the beauty of the gospel.